Dear participants, dear friends, good evening, everyone. It is my sincere pleasure to welcome all of you for this inspiring online seminar series of Tubitak Research Institute for Fundamental Sciences, which were organized for national and international audiences to mitigate the negative impact of COVID-19 coronavirus infection on scientific thoughts and science-based actions. It is also my distinct pleasure to introduce you our tonight's speaker, Dr. Alexander Isayev from Carnegie Mellon University in Petersburg, United States. He has kindly agreed to join us and as part of our chemical science seminar series, he is going to give a talk on neutral networks learning quantum chemistry. Alexander Isayev is an assistant professor at the Department of Chemistry, Carnegie Mellon University. He grew up in Ukraine, and here he obtained his Bachelor of Science and Master of Science degrees in chemistry from Dnipropetrovsk National University in 2012. Then he went to United States, where he obtained his PhD in theoretical chemistry from Jackson State University and did postdoctoral work at Case Western Reserve University between 2009-2012. Following this, his scientific world line also passed through several universities and research centers, in particular through University of California, Los Angeles, University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and in 2012, he joined the Department of Chemistry, Carnegie Mellon University. Alexander, Professor Alexander Isayev's area of expertise include computational chemistry, quantum mechanics, and artificial intelligence. He's actively working towards the acceleration of molecular discovery by combina combination of artificial intelligence informatics and high throughput quantum chemistry, as well as both generative and predictive machine learning models for, chemistry, for chemical and biological data. Professor Alexander Isayev is a recipient of 2017 Emerging Technology Award from the American Chemical Society and Graphic Processing Units GPU Computing Award from Invita Corporation. With this, I want to thank once again Professor Alexander Isai for joining us for this seminar and look forward to his talk. Alexander? Yeah. Thank you so much, Alekran. Thanks for the invitation, and it's my distinct pleasure. Uh, hopefully, you can see my slides. And uh, okay, so. Uh, thank you so much. Thanks for the opportunity. Uh, so what I'd like uh, today to talk to you a little bit about our work, how we use machine learning uh, to accelerate quantum mechanical calculations. <clears throat> and before I start and run out of time, I actually would like to acknowledge, uh, you know, people, you know, students and postdoc in my lab who actually did the work you know, funding sources from the National Science Foundation Office of Naval Research, my collaborators in a group of Adrian Royberg, University of Florida, and, um, you know, Camp Space, Inamin, and, you know, various agencies that provide supercomputing resources for our work. Now, for me, as computational chemist, one of my ultimate dream would be that, you know, all the computations, all the molecules we suggested you know, would work. So essentially like Angel would come and miraculously all your prediction, uh, you know, uh, have been correct and everything is working. And one of the idea and kind of the forward looking uh, direction of, you know, work in our lab or in many other labs is how artificial intelligence can accelerate molecular discovery. So you can imagine that, you know, the smart algorithms and machine would you know, essentially be a hypothesis generation. They can, you know, come up with the structure of the molecule, you know, maybe, uh, you know, run 
you know, hypothesis tests uh, to, you know, to verify this, uh, this idea. And then you can connect the small algorithms, for example, with a robotic platform to synthesize these molecules. This is one example uh, of them. And also with high throughput biological or, you know, can be analytical characterization of the properties of the molecule. And eventually you want to close this loop and therefore essentially uh, have a, you know, artificial chemist, uh, you know, an algorithm or a set of algorithms, a machine, uh, you know, can essentially do AI driven automated molecular discovery. This is a big dream, uh, but there are many academic labs and companies that, you know, work in these directions. Uh, so in my lab, again, you know, via computational chemistry lab, so we work in this corner of you know, developing algorithms. Uh, however, we do work with the you know, you know, experimental scientists who, who make you know, a hardware part uh, of this vision. And, and again, this vision is, is forward looking and probably will not be easy to achieve. But you can think about it to making this AI platform as building a tower. So we, uh, you know, working on specific building blocks, you know, and, and you know, these bricks and these towers, and, you know, collectively, you know, hopefully we can build a full tower and, you know, some kind of a foreseeable future. Now, one of the driving reasons why, you know, we use machine learning is, is this plot. So what I'm showing you here, you know, for those computational chemists in the audience, uh, you can characterize computational chemistry method in terms of their scaling, where n is the is the size of your you know of your system, number of atoms or number of electrons, and some kind of uh, metric of accuracy, right? And therefore, you know, if you look into do a simulation of realistic materials or proteins, and the system size is large thousands and maybe millions of atoms, you typically have to rely on, you know, empirical force fields or, you know, methods that are linear or maybe quadratic and scaling. So you can afford the cost of these calculations. However, the problem is that uncertainty or errors can be very big and therefore accuracy may be very low. However, if you want to reduce this uncertainty, and you know properly describe molecules you'll have to include all the all the fundamental description of quantum mechanics and you have to climb this ladder and use more and more sophisticated method for example semi-empirical methods density functional theory things like hard refoc and finally post hard refoc or so-called you know uh, um, couple cluster theory so for organic molecules couple cluster theory is considered the gold standard and typically provides you what's called the chemical accuracy, you know, one kcal per mole accuracy of calculation with respect to the high quality experiment. However, you pay extreme price of being, you know, power of seven uh, of compute expense. And therefore, this kind of simulation accessible only to small, you know, uh, small organic molecules. And therefore, you cannot do simulation of, of realistic you know, proteins or, or materials. And therefore, you know, and, and finally there, there is a, you know, if you, if you in principle want to do exact solution, so there's a full CI uh, methods with the complete basis set uh, extrapolation. And this is, you know, this is, a, you know, kind of a heaven, which is not practically achieved or anything uh, pragmatic. However, you know, the promise of AI and machine learning methods is to push, uh, you know, the, our methods in this, uh, left corner, where we can take advantage of using our quantum mechanical data and approach uh, uh, to accuracy uh, to these you know, methods, but also maintain this high speed and the uh, you know linear scaling behavior because um, of of the of the favorable scaling of the machine learning methods, and this is exactly what we do, and and again you know for. Uh, Kind of a general introduction. So this is this what uh, you know a time of the potential equation looks like. It's a you know partial differential equation, and you cannot solve it analytically for anything uh, practical uh, rather than hydrogen atom. 
However, if you look at this equation, and therefore we need the big machines to solve it. However, if you look for this equation from the point of view of machine learning, you can rearrange and your ground state energy of your molecule would be the magic function f that depends uh, on your input molecular coordinates. And from the point of view of machine learning, this is what's called the regression problem. And therefore, this is exactly what we do. Uh, you take a molecule, you pass it. In our case, we use neural network and you predict energies. One of the advantage of uh, neural networks, they're fully differentiable. Therefore, you can back propagate and you can compute gradients uh, and have forces and gradients on, on, on your atoms. And therefore, you can do various types of simulation, things like geometry optimization, molecular dynamics, you know, computing Hessians and, and things like that. And, and again, here I'd like to emphasize that, you know, again, for decades, quantum mechanics perceived to be small, uh, slow, sequential. You take a molecule, you use quantum mechanical methods to compute the properties. And this is slow and essentially one molecule at a time. However, as our computational resources grow, uh, Adrian and I, in, uh, we accumulate a, a big, unique database of, of molecules and structure of molecules and you know quantum mechanical energies and properties for many many millions of molecules and I think that you know the unique insight that we can now combine this proper molecular representation we can use uh, you know machine learning methods to predict you know properties energies of the for those molecules. And therefore, you know, this historical accumulated data has you know, a lot of value. Um, so over the years, again, using this analogy with the uh, like a building blocks, uh, we develop number of different uh, neural network architectures. And so uh, there, is a, there is a list of several of them. And again, starting from simple, you know, um, simpler architectures to uh, you know very complicated when neural network combined with the model Hamiltonian methods and so forth. So in in, in this work I, I you know and in, in this talk I, I explained a couple of um, you know of those architectures in, in more details. So in a sense what we see in is emergence of of, uh, of this what's called hybrid machine learned neural network force fields. So when we start our work in 2015 and you know published uh, you know first paper 2016, so our method, what's called uh, ANI1, so first generation of methods, uh, represented total energy and approximate uh, kind of medium to short range interaction with the neural network, and you can also use the empirical dispersion uh, to to describe Van der Waals interactions, and here you can use uh, you know, empirical models like uh, green type dispersion, D2, D3 methods, uh, and so forth. Uh, in addition, just to energy, you know, and I'll show you, we can predict, you know, various per atom properties, things like partial atomic charges, atomic volumes, C6 coefficients. Therefore, you know, in the next generation of ANI, we, 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 we can also add long range electrostatics and maybe high order term as polarization if needed. We can also use more accurate uh, description of the dispersion in what's called uh, many body dispersion um, methods and so forth. And also, alternatively, we have what's called AMNet architecture, and I'll talk in details a uh, you know, few, few slides down the road, where this method is fully data driven. We do not add any physical based terms. And therefore, all types of interaction implicitly are described by the neural network. And, and this is the fully data-driven methods. And these methods are more you know, uh, machine learning plus physics-based terms uh, for the long range interactions. And uh, you know, the jury is still out, you know, which, which of them is better. And you, uh, we still you know, work in the, both directions. So let me tell you, you know, a little bit about how these things work. So ANI, uh, you know, it's a deep neural network. It's a software. It's a method. And uh, so this is the chemical science paper, which describe, uh, you know, a lot more technical details if you're interested to learn. 
And to my knowledge, this is the first uh, neural network-based potential, which is transferable for large classes of organic molecules. And for many, many cases of, of, of classes of organic molecules, it provides you an accuracy of the energies with one kcal per mole from our reference density functional theory. It also five to six order of magnitude faster than DFT calculation. Um, and the way how it works, just to give you a kind of a flavor, uh, to represent a molecule uh, for the purpose of learning, you cannot just use Cartesian coordinates because molecules come different sizes, different shapes, and you know this doesn't satisfy uh, you know requirements to be uh, you know a descriptor of the molecule. Therefore, uh, we represent molecules. It's called uh, atomic atomic centered environment. And you can think about it, it's a, it's a fingerprint vector that encodes for every atom, we have this environment that's centered on the central atom. And that span the radii, you know, in, in this case, five angstroms. And within this cutoff radii, it's encode essentially radial and angular distribution functions of your neighbor's uh, atom. And therefore give you a fingerprint, you know, vector of numbers that encode this chemical environment. And essentially, you would see a neural network zoom in at one environment at a time. And the total energy of the molecule will be sum of this, all of these environments. Right. So this is the presentation. Then to train how this will work, you collect a database of quantum mechanical energies and structures. So you take molecules. Again, each molecule, you featureize every atom, you compute this environment, you pass you know, this environment for every atom through a neural network. And you have this essentially fictitious, you know, local uh, energy of this environment. You sum them up and then you look uh, for the error of this. Tot now this is the total energy of the full molecule. And now you compare with ground true or from the quantum mechanical uh, um, energy, you know, you compute the error, compute the cost gradient, and update the weights of your neural network. So you do the standard you know, training of the neural network and you iterate until your uh, neural network been trained. So if you want to do the simulation, then this became use, this essentially pre-trained neural network. It's a, it's a Python function. You can plug it into uh, your favorite simulation packages you know, for molecular dynamics or you know, any kind of simulation. And then it serves you essentially a black box your feed molecular geometry, it gives you energy and forces, and you, as usually, do uh, you know, yeah, normal you know, simulation as usual. So what we have currently available, we parameterize seven elements. As you can see, those are most important biogenic elements, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen, sulfur, and a couple of halogens. So this is already published, publicly available. And if you draw me uh, any organic molecule with these elements, we'll give you energy and forces. We have more elements in the progress. You know, again, we, we continue for more non-metals. Uh, we also explore it for, you know, also metals, salts, things like that. Again, for computational chemists in the audience, our choice was particular uh, DFT functional called Omega B97 uh, XD. Uh, uh, this is... Uh, Range separated hybrid functional uh, from Martin Head Gordon group. And you know, over the COVID period, uh, we also switch a little bit um, modern. So this this functional has been developed probably 10 years ago. We switch for um, um, a, a little bit more uh, modern flavor of these functionals. Also, you know, switch from double zeta basis set to a triple zeta basis set. And also we have again um, a, a neural network and parameterized on the couple of clusters. Um, simulations as well. Uh, one thing as I think is a very interesting uh, feature of the machine learning methods is that we can also have an idea of some uncertainty, how accurate or, you know, how confidently a model think it can predict, uh, you know, energy and properties. And again, if you're interested for mathematical formulation, there is our journal chemical physics paper uh, two years ago. Uh, but just, just to give you an idea is uh, what we use, what's called the ensemble disagreement. 
so imagine we have a prescribed recipe how we can train several independent neural networks. Uh, and then you in certain phase space, you made the prediction of energy and forces. And what you can observe that there is this, you know, as you can see, there is a certain region where this uh, agree, you know, the predictions agree and a certain region where prediction disagree. So you have a large deviation between the, uh, these predictions. Since we use quantum mechanics as our ground through, we can query it and essentially have a, you know, exact oracle to tell us what is the exact energies. And what we show in this paper and also you know, our, you know, many other scientists show in different domains that when this disagreement is large, this is typically indications that we have either bad data coverage or a model overfit. But the good thing is that in principle, you don't need to do quantum mechanical calculation. You just need uh, to compute this measure of disagreement to kind of give you an idea when you have this bad data coverage. And we use this ensemble disagreement essentially to indicate you know, how model is confident or not in the accuracy of, of prediction for energies. And just you know, quickly um, I'll show you one quick example. Uh, so this is a simulation, again, with any neural network, one molecule uh, in the droplet of water. And what here on the left I'm showing you, so it's a molecular dynamic snapshots, and this ensemble disagreement for every atom. And as you can see here, it starts, you know, all, all values are small, but then this one pesky atom, that's, you know, essentially this ensemble disagreement is explored. It's very, very high, and you can easily see it here. And so this allow us, in the, you know, find the problem. So we look for this atom. It it's actually was one of the oxygen of the water. And what essentially happens, since this is a, a model in development, you know, at this point when this disagreement became very high, the uh, what I'm plotting you here is actually this HOH angle of the water molecule. So this is, you know, this angle of water. And uh, the this particular water molecule started to behave weirdly. So this, this angle became very large and essentially started to approach in the, like a flat. And this is an unphysical. And you see this, uh, you know, increasing of this angle, but uh, the, essentially this metric allow us to find this artifact. And therefore this is the way how improve and monitor the accuracy of these simulations. And therefore this is a very uh, good uh, feature to have in contrast to a classical standard force field, when you cannot do this uncertainty quantifications. Now, uh, just a little bit more in, in terms of the accuracy of the energy. So here on the on the left, you know, uh, I would, I'm showing you here again, you know, with respect to the, the quantum mechanical simulations, there with the very wide uh, window of energy, about 300 kcal per mole. Again, the, the potential systematically provides you an accuracy from one to two kcal per mole in terms of root and square error. And here on the right, again, uh, what I'm comparing here is the potential energy surface for the several of these molecules and how the potential energy surface was plotted. I'm picking a couple of these dihedral angles and I start to rotate and basically you can build you know, this 2D potential energy surface map. Here on the right is quantum mechanics. On the left, this is our potential. And as you can see in many cases, you can hardly see the difference. So this is again, summary statistic for the error uh, for all, all the full potential energy surface. But what is also apparent is that a neural network can reproduce even the smallest, you see these kinks in this potential energy surface, all these little feature structures. And again, this is very, very hard to do uh, if you ever fitted a uh, standard classical force fields. Again, the same story with the accuracy of molecular dynamics and the forces. You know, this is an example of ab initio molecular dynamics versus molecular dynamics using the ani potential. Again, energy, you know, in terms of energy within one kcal per mole for this particular GSK, uh, you know, drug like molecules. And the accuracy of forces. So, this is the error of the force. Um, force component, uh, magnitude of the force components 
within three to four kikel per mole per angstrom, uh, which is again very, very accurate. Now, uh, let me show you a little bit more practical applications. What you can do with this now? You can generate, you know, three-dimensional structure of the molecule. You can, you know, help, you know, pre-optimize molecular geometries for small organic molecules. But I think the results are in part uh, my, my quite wider as well. So force fields are used uh, to compute protein ligand binding free energy. And again, it's quite expensive simulation because you need to, you know, do a molecular dynamic simulation of protein ligand complex, typically it talks of water. Typical performance is of, for the well-behaved proteins or, or the accuracy of this free energy simulation within one to two kilopar per mole. However, because classical standard force field param parameters uh, are very simple, um, you know, form, in, in some cases that leads to unphysical torsions for small molecules and all kinds of error. And also standard force fields have very hard time to, to describe this coupling between these multiple torsions, you know, think I, I show you here. So this is, this is an example. Again, we have this uh, very recent preprint and this work is collaboration with the lab of John Cadera, New York. And uh, so what we did, uh, we, we take uh, this particular protein called TIC2, this is the kinase, this is a human kinase protein, which is important for, you know, cancer. And, but also, uh, this particular protein has very high quality binding free energy, uh, experimental binding free energy for, for the series of these compounds where R, you see this is a series of the congenetic compounds with this uh, substituents, and this is actual free energies. Uh, so what, here on the left, this is comparison of computed uh, free energies versus experimental free energies. And so the shaded gray area, this is the region with acceptable errors. Uh, so if you look for the summary statistics or so Rootman square error for, uh, for the free, binding free energy, it's actually one kcal, it's not bad. However, if you look for R square, so the correlation, essentially the ranking of these molecules. It's, one, it's 0.4. And this is because of this, actually these outliers where you have much larger error than some of the other molecules. And therefore this, this accuracy is not good enough for the practical um, drug discovery. So what we did is essentially in the spirit of what's, you know, what is known QMMM calculations, you can also do hybrid MLMM calculations where at this point, you can this, you can use a neural network to describe a behavior of our ligand in the system. Uh, however, the behavior of the protein and the water around it will still be described through uh, you know standard force fields because at this point we we have parameters only for small molecules. We don't have a protein a neural network protein force field yet. So. And then you can essentially, you know, uh, write appropriate, um, you know, thermodynamic cycle, how to compute these free energies, run the simulation again, the, the technical description in, in this, uh, in this preprint. And therefore, again, if you look for this absolute uh, binding free energy calculations on the left, again, using the force field, state of the art methods, what we have, right? Again, if you use force field with, with ANI, uh, this is what you get. Clearly see, right? We have substantial re reduction of error. You know, our RMSC drop twice, right? From 0.97, essentially from one kcal to half. But what's most importantly, R square correlation rose from 0.4 to 0.86, double. And again, this is, uh, this is now is, you know, acceptable quality high uh, high um, high accuracy free energy simulation for uh, protein ligands, and and again, why it's happening is this is another application of, of our method for you know, interestingly enough, for a different kinase. But the story is the same: is that when you fit a, a potential, you know, a force field parameters for for the ligand. This is, this is the map of potential energy surface, what you get out of the force field. 
This is what quantum mechanics tells you, high accuracy quantum mechanical energy. And you can see that minima and maxima doesn't, doesn't even close, even close. So this is the quantum mechanical minima, which corresponds to actually to a maxima in the, in the force field. This is what Ani will give you. And you can see very high accuracy. And, and because of that, you can, you can describe, you know, conformation of the ligand much more accuracy. This will give you this boost in the, in the accuracy of free energy simulations. Again, the current uh, feature of, 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 of our software, again, uh, as I told you, available elements, um, uh, code on GitHub, you can do geometry minimization, you know, things like analytic hashing, molecular dynamics. We have implementation of periodic boundary conditions and things like that. Uh, in the last uh, 15 minutes, let me show you a little bit uh, more advanced that can we go beyond just fitting the models to an energy? Can we also add more physics to it, uh, to the, our machine learning? And again, we can continue on this analogy of building this uh, like a building blocks, but now we can use this analogy for working with the neural networks. And now essentially, I played with this Lego blocks to play with different architecture of neural networks. Again, um, this is again our ANI architecture, and and this is very simple. So you take your molecular coordinates uh, and essentially encode uh, atomic environments through you know this particular uh, angular and radial distribution functions, and pass through a neural network. So this the the shaded in blue, uh, this is our mathematical transformation. The things in green, this is our neural network, you know, and this in, in, in orange or yellow, this is our predictions. Now, we, we, we try to, you know, again, play and, and, and see if we can improve this architecture. And for example, this is what's called our AIMnet architecture, where we improve this with a couple of things. So first, we can also make our embeddings our representation of atoms to be learnable as well. So now this we have an additional uh, neural network building blocks. We can also uh, improve for the long range interactions uh, having this update blocks that would essentially pass messages from environment uh, to environment and accounting for the missing long range interactions. And thirdly, we can also, again, train to multiple different properties uh, instead of just for energy. And hence, this is our what's called AIMnet architecture, and uh, so AIM is you know is, is called stands from atoms in molecules. So this is inspired by the Bader theory of atoms and molecules. So we have um, you know essentially analogies that these vectors, these embeddings that describe atoms inside our molecules, essentially consistent with our neighbors because of this you know, uh, messaging and, and updates. And uh, this is much more, uh, you know, larger, more complex architecture has 30 layers and 1 million parameters for that. Uh, I'll probably in the interest of time, I'll skip uh, about the importance of, of, of the situations. Uh, however, but what I like to show you is, is actually because now we have this learned representation of every atoms, we can actually build these maps and for example, for our, you know, for our elements, each dot would represent, you know, a specific atom inside the molecules. And this is, you know, a few thousand of different molecules. And you can see each atoms are clustered, each atom types. They are actually a little bit resemble a periodic table itself. So you can see that hydrogen closer to halogens than to the carbon, you know, kind of looks like this. And if you look inside the uh, learned representation, for example, for carbons, you can see the small subclusters that a neural network learns about, you know, the carbons in different types of environments, for example, with the, uh, you know, with electron donating or withdrawing or, you know, kind of polar, non-polar environments. And also what is well interesting that this, uh, this kind of map differentiate uh, carbons in, in this particular case with different partial atomic charges. So here you have very large positive charge and this you have a negative charge on carbon. And again, it's, it's all learned by neural network by itself. You didn't put it there by hand. Uh, now, if you train to multiple different properties, so for example, 
uh, in, the, in the original paper, we train uh, to energy in the gas phase, and also continuum salvation model. And therefore, now you can, for example, compare with real experimental observables, for example, uh, uh, free energies of salvation from the, from the experiment. And uh, this picture on the left give you an idea about accuracy of the uh, experimental free energies of salvation versus computed free energies. So the accuracy 1.8 kicl per mole R square 0.8. Uh, and this accuracy is expected because again, we are not uh, taking the explicit solvent molecules. This is a continuum model of salvation. Therefore, this is, this is, this is uh, uh, you know, uh, this kind of accuracy is expected and you, you, you cannot go much uh, further, especially for very polar and charged molecules uh, because of the continuum model approximations. Um, we can also explore a little bit and, you know, uh, chemical reactivity. So, for example, uh, what I showed you before was well, neural nets have been trained only to neutral organic molecules. However, we can also run a molecular dynamics for molecules in neutral, for example, plus one and minus one state. And we can, we can compute, you know, the energy for these three states, but we can also uh, compute the... Uh, transformation from neutral to charged, plus one to minus one, and, and so forth. Therefore, you can have the seven options uh, you know, to compute uh, this transformation. And then what you can do, again, uh, you can train a neural network. You can train, for example, a neural network for each charged state separately. You can also kind of go to multitask and train one neural network and predict you know, energies of charge, neutral, you know, plus one, minus one states at the same time. But also what's, what's more interesting, we can also go one step further and we can input our total uh, molecular charge in, into the neural network and let essentially a neural network deal uh, how to distribute charges inside the molecule and always predict the energy. So you're approaching more correct physical behavior when the discrete charge state would, would give you essentially the energies of this particular state. And uh, just, to, just to show you again, accuracy of the prediction for cations, neutral anions. Uh, and therefore from these three states, you can compute ionization potentials, electron affinity. And again, the accuracy of this like two to three chemical per mole, very good correlation. And what is also interesting since your you condition your neural network on these total charges. What's happening in, 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 in the neural network conceptually, uh, we have this block, uh, which we called uh, neural spin equilibration. And essentially what it does, it, it, it's responsible for this long range non-local uh, charge effects uh, where you can think about if you have this prototypical molecule, and again, you have two conjugated uh, rings and electron donating, electron withdrawing group. So what happen in, in if, you, if you attach or detach electron, so in the quantum mechanics, you can see the formation of the cation or, or anion, uh, but also this non-local effects where you have this essentially like a spin wave, alternation of positive negative charges, or, or rather spin, spin charges in the QM. And the neural network essentially work in this way. It equilibrates through this message passive mechanism and re-equilibrate our charges and spin charges in the molecule. And you can see as the number of these messages increase, you can see the correct behavior of alternative positive and negative charges as the neural network predicted. And therefore, again, that's, that's, this, this mechanism can be used you know, in conjunction with the what's the you know physics-based uh, you know charge equilibration scheme like QEC as well, and the application of of this is actually very interesting. That if you remember uh, your quantum mechanical uh, classes, there is a theory what's called conceptual DFT theory, or what's called the chemical reactivity theory, and in this theory you can relate the derivative of the energy with respect to the total number of electrons in the system 
and compute things like chemical potential, molecular hardness, you know, electrophilicity indices, Fukui indices, again, global and local index indices on, on the atom of the systems. Therefore, you can, you can relate these quantities with the essential derivative by the number of electrons in the system. So what this architecture allows us to do, essentially compute this, all these indices, all these derivatives, by fully bypassing quantum mechanics, by modulating this incoming charges and register, you know, computing these partial atomic charges and spins and computing all these properties essentially fully data driven inside the neural network. And basically you don't need quantum mechanics and wave function analysis to compute conceptual DFT indexes anymore. Uh, let me show you an ex practical example. So instead of showing the correlation, how good properties can be predicted. Uh, so in, 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 again, in our paper, and so this is again the, the preprint uh, link. What we go, we take an example of the electrophilic aromatic substitution reaction. So again, this is one of the classical, uh, you know, uh, widely used reaction. And, and there is a, there is a, you know, in this, reaction, there is a problem of regular selectivity, depending on the, you know, stability of this, you know, sigma complex intermediate, depending on where this charge can be localized. Your reaction go in the particular, you know, orta, meta or para position. And to, to predict the regular selectivity of this reaction, the state of the art methods are quantum mechanics. And, and in fact, there is a, there's a method called regular SQM. Again, this is, this is the link. Uh, that use semi-empirical methods, again, with, uh, with the continuum um, uh, approximation for the solvent to essentially using semi-empirical calculation to compute, enumerate all these all this complexes and, you know, uh, compare the energy and therefore typically take one hour per molecule. It's fast, but it's not fast enough to do high throughput uh, calculations and predicts thousands and maybe millions of molecules uh, for the need, for example, in drug discovery. So what we did, again, we took our model. We have not done any specific retraining for this rigid selectivity prediction. And this is what, what we did. Uh, again, we, we took all this data from paper. And this is, you know, this validation accuracy, this is test accuracy on the, on the data set uh, from this paper. And as you can see here, if you just use quantum mechanics, compute this, uh, you know, this uh, uh, conceptual DFT uh, parameters, you get, you know, 90% accuracy in the validation. If you combine quantum mechanical, you know, this conceptual DFT indices with this uh, radio SQM, you go a little bit better. Uh, what we took, again, we take AMNET, compute all this on this on this indices, but we also included this, you know, at, learn at, atomic environment representation for every atom. And you can essentially match the accuracy of the quantum mechanics. However, in terms of relative timing, we can do it a million times faster. Therefore, you can essentially compute in you know, a very high throughput uh, fashion, very accurately. You can, you, you can predict the outcomes uh, for, the, uh, for the chemical reactions. Um, this is another example. Again, uh, it's collaboration company Y. Unfortunately, I cannot disclose what reaction and the company is, but the same story, again, we can use AMNET to predict the outcomes uh, for this particular coupling reaction in, in, in this case. And, and again, this is uh, the only way to approach the accuracy of QM, of, of QM calculation in the prediction uh, of, the, of the yield in this case of the, of the, of the coupling reaction. So with that, let me finish with a couple of, of thoughts about uh, you know, from my point of view, what is next? I think, you know, this is really exciting times and we see, you know, maturing of this, um, you know, uh, field of machine learning. And I can think, you know, just to wrap up uh, with this uh, movie. So what I'm showing you here, again, this is our ANI, uh, the same ANI neural network. What we had a little bit of carbon-carbon uh, uh, bone breaking data. And what we run here, so this is a simulation, 4,000 atoms, 60 ans, answer. This is a cubic box with the periodic boundary condition. So this five nanosecond molecular dynamic simulation with extreme temperature, so 2,500 degrees. 
a very high temperature simulation. So when you run the simulation, you start from the essentially random uh, hot carbon vapor. And what you can see is essentially formation of the graphene nanoflakes. You see formation of this fullerene. So this is a bucky, you know, buckyball here and the growth of the buckyball into the essentially larger nanotubes. And it's the same potential what we trained to a small organic molecules before with addition a little bit of carbon-carbon breaking data. If you do quantitative analysis, probably the simulation is still wrong and barriers kinetic can be you know, very wrong. But conceptually on the physics-based level, what I think it shows you that these machine learning models can learn physics. And despite the fact that we never show any nanotubes or nanomaterials, so the potential learn enough that carbon preferred to do conjugated six membrane rings and stack them into the layers and, and the sheets. I think this, this gives us a promise that you know, we can really push the boundaries of computational methods to allow you know, realistic simulation of materials, reactions. And hopefully this will not us take you know, 50 more years. Uh, with that, let me advertise a shameless plug. I'm an editor of the journal. It's called Applied AI Letters. Uh, so if you do high quality, you know, machine learning for the sciences and scientific application, please, you know, submit a paper to our journal. It's an open access journal. And uh, we're glad to see application of machine learning in chemistry, physics, and biology. And with that, let me finish and just leave you with the links. All our codes available on GitHub. Uh, again, implementation of ANI, use a PyTorch uh, uh, as the framework in Python. Uh, we have uh, ANI plugins for several packages, things like OpenMM, Amber, NumD, Tinker, Lumps, uh, AMNet, again, here in, in, in our GitHub. Uh, most of our data is also available. So if you're interested in reference quantum mechanical data, DFT couple cluster, this is the link and publication. And again, things, our methods are used uh, globally, you know, in Europe, US, uh, Israel, you know, a lot of companies and government entities in US and you know, some of the companies in Europe again use this. With that, thank you very much. And I would be delighted to ask, uh, to answer any questions. Thank you so much for this very interesting and comprehensive talk. Uh, please ask questions. You can ask questions using the chat button of the Zoot platform, platform write in a message, or you can also use microphone to ask questions. Please ask questions. Don't be shy. Okay, let me read. I see there's a location. Uh, so the question is what the platform is you trained model deploy? So it's a, it's a pre-trained uh, Python function. Uh, we tried mostly on Linux, but it should work Windows, Mac OS, doesn't matter. If you can run a Python environment, PyTorch library, and have CUDA, you know, NVIDIA GPUs, it should work. Uh, it might also work without GPUs, but, you know, with, new, with, the, with the GPUs, um, it's faster. Uh, so the question is, which features are more relevant uh, for the estimation? Could you please uh, elaborate for estimation of what? Energies or? Ah, uh, types of molecules. That's a good question. Uh, we didn't do analysis. Um, so I 
cannot take tell it uh, what features are more relevant. Uh, but again, if you want to try, you know, again, our code is open, and and you know, you can try and and, and see how it works. So the ion channel. So the, the next question would be: Is it possible to model ion channels uh, by QM? Um, it's a good question. Ion channels are challenging. And at this point, we do not have a good description of ions yet, especially, you know, you need sodium, maybe calcium, things like that. We're working, um, so internally, we do have a neural network parameter for water, uh, liquid water. We started working with ions and, you know, and uh, into proteins, uh, but no, we don't have, uh, you know, a good model yet. In principle, that's what we want. But at this point, I don't think we can do any um, any simulation of uh, of the ions. Um, have you used uh, the SNAP neural network to 3D QSAR? We didn't, uh, but please, it, it's, a, it's a perfect example you can use either new, new neural network or pre-trained and use it as soon as you have three-dimensional structure of the molecules. You can extract feature from it and use for QSAR application. No problem. Dear uh, Professor Alexander, uh, I have a couple of questions. Yes, please. Uh, can yeah. you hear me? Yes, yes. Uh, th uh, thank you very much for this nice presentation. Uh, my first question uh, is about uh, a comparison of the tensor networks and uh, neural networks. Uh, we can also represent the quantum states by using tensor networks. And I think tensor, tensor network simulations uh, are also start to play light in biochemical uh, molecules as well. Uh, do you have any idea about this comparison? Uh, is, there, is, is there an advantage of uh, neural networks against tensor networks in the simulation of uh, chemical molecules? Ah, okay. Interesting question. I wish I have a good answer for you. I have not tried, so unfortunately, I cannot tell you. Uh, but so far, um, what we see, there are, there are many other types of machine learning methods. Uh, what we see, the neural network are uh, indeed very flexible, works for many different types of applications, uh, not only to predict QM, but we also use it for you know, screening, biological drug discovery, other applications as well. Um, but specifically, unfortunately, I don't know. All questions, please. So the question is, can we use quantum neural network for prediction? Yes, that's the whole point of our work. If you go, let me share my screen back, right? If you see, uh, where is my pointer? So you see this GitHub links? So you go here, right? Uh, we have a package, you know, the software in Python and pre-trained neural network. You go here again, we have AMNet pre-trained neural network and you can use it in out of the box with a simulation. However, the caveat is that so far been what we parameterize a new, new neutral organic molecules. So, uh, so don't try to use for materials or liquids. It will give you an answer, but probably answer will be wrong. Uh, again, we have also plugins for you know, several simulation packages, like here. And if you use, for example, OpenMM, you can use uh, any model inside OpenMM or you know, soon Amber, NAMD, and LAMPS and do simulation. Uh, okay, let me read. Uh, Okay, so the next question, is it possible to study with molecules having higher multiplicity radicals and b-radicals? So what I showed you for the AMNET NSE, 
This is for anion cation radicals. We have not tried bi radicals yet, uh, but in principle, yes. If you want to train your own neural network to study bi radicals, you can take our code and train for, you know, your own specific problem. Or you can use this model for, you know, for cation and anion radicals of organic molecules. It should work. Dear Professor, I have a couple of more questions as well, and sorry for the background noise. I have a, a small kit. Uh, Please, uh, yeah, don't, 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 don't apologize. We all work from home these days. Yes, <laughs> thank, you very, thank you very much. Uh, my next, next question is that uh, uh, this neural network uh, representation, uh, can this representation enable us to calculate the thermal state of a, a molecule instead of the ground state? Is it possible uh, to obtain thermal state as well? Yes. To predict, yeah. And is, is there any computational cost uh, when we compare it with the ground state uh, simulation? So uh, again, what we've done so far, what I show you, we show ground state, we show cation radicals, anion radicals, things like that. So if you're interested, for example, like excited states or you know, other things, we do not have pre-trained model yet, but you can use our software, our models uh, to train neural network for your practical application. So if you're interested, for example, you know, excitation, things like that, However, you will need your own training data, quantum mechanics, to train neural network for you. Thanks. Then my so point conceptually, is conceptually, yes, but if we have not done this particular application, somebody has to do it first to pre-train it. I see. Uh, then my next question is about this uh, training. Uh, the accuracy of the reference method or the uh, reference size of the reference molecules. Uh, this, is there any restriction of this uh, uh, quantities uh, in the applicability of the uh, method? Uh, for oh, example, yes. yeah. yeah. Absolutely. So if your QM method is wrong, you will, neural net will, will give you a wrong answer, right? So you have to be careful what methods to use. Some methods may not be good, not applicable for the applications. And you probably know much better for, you know, what reference method to use. Thank you very much. Okay, so the question is, what is the quantum control on the effect of molecule structures to change their chemical properties? Could you please clarify what is the specifically what I mean by quantum control? I don't know if you can, Akar, if you can unmute or clarify. I'm not exactly sure what is quantum control. Uh, uh, hello. Yes. Uh, I mean, uh, applying photons or electromagnetic field or uh, electric field. Uh, ah, okay. As, as an open quantum uh, system. Uh, this is very advanced. We are not there yet. I think you can probably you can probably design a neural network that will describe it to you. But at this point, again, we, we just started. And uh, to my knowledge, no one done this before. Uh, in principle, again, neural network are very good and approximate a, a lot of different, you know, phenomena and processes, uh, but we have not done and uh, I don't know how to do it. Maybe I didn't mean uh, to use the neural network for control purpose. 
I mean, uh, without using uh, neural network, by uh, using photons or electric field to change the uh, molecular structures, uh, the angle of the binding of atom. Ah, okay, I see. Yeah, so that that there's certainly processes uh, that can do it. Uh, but again, uh, for kind of application what we, we've done so far, there was no light involved. So there's no, there's no excitation, there's no absorption. Um, so it's all ground state at this point. Thank you, thank you. And again, if there are any follow-ups, so Ali Kramp has my email. Please feel free. Yeah, yeah, sure. <clears throat> to follow up and you know. So it seems that there is no more questions. Uh, ah, there's ah, one question the from Professor Akol. Yes. So what is the limitation of our software? Um, there are few, right? So in principle, you know, you can take the software, you can adapt to your own problems, but you will have to retrain neural network. The current limitation of applications is, you know, if you read the paper, and happy to send you links, specifically to what, to what we parameterize. So what we parameterize and what is publicly available, you know, it's for isolated small organic molecules. You can you can do this hybrid MLMM simulation of proteins and ligands, but neural network, again, responsible only to a, to a, to a ligand part. Again, the, also the limitation would be, do not use it to do simulation of liquid water, you know, surface. It is not trained yet. So it works at this point, what is publicly available, not in development, what, what we have so far. The publicly available work for you know organic normal organic molecules. Okay, more questions, please. So if no more questions, Alexander, perhaps we can stop here. What do you think? Yes. yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Thanks for inviting Thank you once again so much. It's my pleasure. And, you know, hopefully next time in person. <laughs> yeah. Next time, I hope it will be in person. Uh, yes. Face uh, to face again, discussing all us. these exciting things. Yes. Thank you so much. And stay safe uh, during these difficult times. And thank you so much and have a nice Okay, day. thank you.